Hey everyone, and welcome to Starting Personas and Their Meaning, the Persona 3 episode. In this series, I'll be talking about the lore and importance of each party member's starting persona in every Persona game. The starting personas of your party hold great meaning to the characters and draw parallels to the individual throughout the story. I've always appreciated the thought that went into deciding the best mythological or historical figure that was suited to the party member you'll be spending the rest of your adventure with. This series aims to explain the importance of these choices. In this video, we'll be going in-depth over Persona 3's cast of playable characters and their unique starting personas. Also, a special guest starring in every video. Stay tuned, and spoilers ahead. First up, Makoto Yuki, the stoic music lover, or the main character. His persona is Orpheus of the Fool Arcana. Orpheus in Greek mythology was a musician, poet, and prophet. He was the son of Ogris and Calliope, but it was Apollo who taught Orpheus the lyre when he was a young man. Orpheus was one of the many Argonauts, playing his lyre to protect his fellows from the temptations of the siren's song. The most famous story of Orpheus is of him and his wife Eurydice having a stroll, when suddenly a satyr appeared and tried to get a little too handsy with Eurydice. She avoided him but ended up falling into a viper's den and was fatally poisoned. Orpheus found her body and with his lyre played a song so emotional that the gods wept. The gods advised him to travel to the underworld to bring his wife back. When Orpheus traveled to the underworld as guided, he met with Hades and his wife Persephone. Pleading with them, he played his mournful tune. Hades and Persephone's hearts were then swayed, and allowed him to leave with Eurydice. With one caveat, do not look back before reaching the surface. Orpheus and Eurydice just managed to make it to the surface, when Orpheus looked back, anxious to see if Eurydice was behind him. Though, when he turned back, she disappeared into the underworld forever. Orpheus later died at the hand of Dionysian Maenads for solely venerating Apollo and remaining faithful to his lost love Eurydice. In Persona 3, you must shepherd your friends through Tartarus, a level of Hades, to the top with a mostly unknown power. Though most of his personality is based on the player's own decisions, some immutable character traits are exemplified by him. Polite, well-spoken, and brave, Makoto strides into the dungeons of Tartarus and at the end of his journey, dies protecting what he loves. Orpheus' design is that of a slender robot with segmented limbs. A large red scarf rests upon his shoulders in front of a massive lyre he mastered in his lifetime. Mostly resembles Makoto himself, but an interesting design nonetheless. Yukari Takeba, the sharpshooting daddy's girl. Her persona is Io of the Lover's Arcana. Io was the river god Argus Inachus and sea nymph Milia's daughter. Under the name Calithia, Io was the first priestess of Hera, wife of Zeus. Zeus, being Zeus, fell in love with Io and brought her to a cloud formation he made to hide them. Hera was immediately suspicious and found her husband sitting on a cloud with a young cow. Hera, also being quite a powerful god, saw through Zeus's strange attempts to disguise Io and demanded she receive the cow as a present from him. Hera then assigned Argus, the all-seeing, to guard her from Zeus's less-than-faithful hands. Zeus, feeling pity for her, sent the god Hermes to retrieve Io by lulling Argus to sleep and leaving Greece. After some time, Hera sent out a gadfly to torment Io, who traveled across the Ionian Sea to arrive at Egypt. There, Io was found to have returned to her original form and with a son named Epiphus. Io was identified as the Egyptian god Isis, goddess of magic, and Epiphus was Apis, the sacred bull. Yukari at first seems like an average happy and bubbly girl, but underneath the exterior, she is immensely lonely. She values bonds with others immensely, but is careful not to be too open so as to not lose anyone, especially after her father's passing. Such loneliness lends itself to lapses in judgment that feed into her anxiety and bitter selfishness. Though Yukari is not perfect, and to many she seems to be a bad person, same as Io, overcomes her trauma and develops true and deep relationships with her family and friends. By the end of the game, she almost resembles a completely different person, one true to herself. Io's design is that of a jet black slender woman chained within a metallic bull's head. Her feet and arms are bound, awaiting her rescue and transformation into her super persona, Isis. This design is amazing and truly reflects the Greek roots of the character. Junpei Iori, the ace detective best friend. His persona is Hermes of the Magician Arcana. Hermes was the youngest of the twelve Olympians and was the chosen messenger of the gods in Greek mythology. In the Greek epic, the Odyssey, not only is Hermes portrayed as the messenger of the gods, but also the guide and conductor of the dead to Hades. 
Often seen as Apollo's counterpart, Hermes was the patron of music and art. Hermes created the lyre as a gift to Apollo, and Apollo created Hermes's winged staff, the same staff often associated with medicine to this day. They were both gods irrevocably tied to one another, yet serve very different purposes. Hermes is the patron god of travelers, commerce, athletics, literature, and gain by any means. Hermes guides those on the path, but his duties are never ending. Because of his gain by any means outlook, he is often regarded as the divine trickster. In Homer's A Hymn to Hermes, it recounts many tales of Hermes' childhood, such as stealing Apollo's cattle, to which he later apologized by offering the lyre to him. Junpei, in many aspects, conveys a childlike behavior. Immature and headstrong, he jumps into new situations with equal parts confidence and ignorance. Despite this, Junpei is thoughtful when his carefree facade is dropped later in the game. Initially, Junpei's reason to join Seas is to be a hero and gain some recognition, though just like Hermes, his role is not as a leader. Hermes' role as messenger between realms is even exemplified by Junpei's love for Chidori, Junpei being the only link between the protagonist Seas and the seemingly evil Strega, obsessed with death and the end of the world. Junpei is probably the best best bro archetype in Persona, as it even somewhat mirrors Hermes and Apollo, though with Orpheus rather than the true god. Hermes' design is that of a black and gold automaton, with gold segmented plates resembling wings attached to his hands and feet. He wears a gold helmet, also with wings adorning it, the same as the winged cap Hermes is often depicted with in Greek mythology. Hermes is in line with Orpheus' more robotic design, which fits. Mitsuru Kirijo, the original teenage manager. Her persona is Penthesilia, of the Empress Arcana. Penthesilia is the daughter of Ares, Greek god of war, and Otrera, founder of the Amazons. One of many daughters, Penthesilia accidentally killed her sister Hopolita, and as penance for this act, she joined the Trojan War, leading her mother's Amazonians into battle. Well respected for her skill with weapons, bravery, and wisdom, she fought against the Greeks in the tenth and final year of the war. Penthesilia met the great hero Achilles in battle and managed to kill him, only for Achilles to be brought back to life by Zeus and come back to kill her. It's still an impressive feat nonetheless. While Achilles did come back to fight her, it is said that when her helmet fell off, Achilles fell in love with her and promised that after her death, he would return her body unharmed to the Trojans. Mitsuru is calm, confident, skilled, and wise beyond her years. Coming from a family of strict conduct, she's forced into the position that she's in, though she does little to fight against it. Mitsuru has an unshakable moral code, and unquestioningly does what she must for the good of the world. That isn't to say that she doesn't have reservations or regrets, as she is only a teenage girl. She leads and fights at the behest of her father and her friends, but unlike Penthesilia, Mitsuru fights for what she believes in rather than penance. The defining character traits of maturity and wisdom are always present, and while she may not show it much, she enjoys combat even as much as Akihiko does. Penthesilia's design is that of a woman wearing an armored corset with a breastplate connected by chains, as well as leggings with white boots. She wields a fencing rapier and longsword in either hand, and her knight's helmet is topped with a crown, signifying her status as the queen of the Amazons. This design doesn't exactly scream Amazonian, but it suits her highborn status and combat prowess well. Next up we have Akihiko Sanada. Almost like a big brother to the team, Akihiko is a skilled fighter. Determined, disciplined, and maybe a little dorky. One of the founding members of the team, Akihiko's early childhood was spent in an orphanage with his sister Miki as well as fellow team member Shinjiro Aragaki. Following Miki's tragic death and a fire that took the orphanage with it, Akihiko has constantly made an effort to become stronger to keep her memory alive, going to every effort to avoid feeling powerless again. Possessing the Emperor Arcana, Akihiko starts off the game with the persona Polydeuces. In Greek and Roman mythology, Polydeuces was one of two warrior twins, with the other being Castor, who also happened to be Shinjiro's persona. Polydeuces was skilled at hunting and horseback riding, and was even involved in the famous story of Jason and the Argonauts, where he defeated the king of a mythical tribe in, you guessed it, a boxing match. Polydeuces and Castor also set off to rescue their sister Helen when she was kidnapped, invading an entire kingdom just to get her back, which lines up with Akihiko's own desire to strengthen himself for the sake of his own sister. Interestingly, while the twins had the same mother, Lita, Polydeuces' father was actually none other than Zeus, making him immortal. The same can't be said for Castor, whose father was a mortal man called Tyndareus. 
Considering Akihiko survives a battle against death itself, and well, Shijiro doesn't make it that far, it definitely seems like the developers did their research when picking personas for these guys. Upon Castor's death in mythology, Polydeuces requests to share his immortality with his brother, and the two become the Gemini constellation. Crazy stuff. In the game, after Shinjiro dies, Akihiko struggles for a while, but eventually decides to carry Shinjiro's memory with him and press onwards, awakening to a new persona, Caesar. Now Caesar isn't just a name, it's actually a title that was given to rulers of Imperial Rome. This title, of course, was derived from the famous Emperor Julius Caesar. Caesar just kind of represents sheer power, I mean look, he's holding the world in his hands. At this point, Akihiko is ready for anything, able to take on whatever challenges lie ahead with an iron will. Also, he looks a lot like Emperor Hazuma from Shin Megami Tensei Hit. Just had to throw that one in there. The visual design of both of Akihiko's personas are also pretty interesting. Polydeuces takes on a strange form that's both noble and terrifying. His long flowing hair seems like a typical characteristic of the classic knight in shining armor, but his head is oddly misshapen and stuffed down into the armor. His limbs are even more unusual, starting off as powerful and muscular, and gradually becoming more and more thin, with nearly pointed ends in the case of his legs. Rather than a sword or a bow, Polydeuces has what looks like a screwdriver attached to his arm. To me, what this design says is that Akihiko is still a hero in the making. Like the Greek legend, he's a skilled fighter, but with the muscle and armor comes a covered mouth and oddly soulless looking eyes, perhaps implying that Akihiko has a lot to learn, or that he hasn't awoken to his true feelings for his team yet. Caesar's design is much more refined, majestic, and looks much less clumsy. He has a powerful, unchanging expression, and his sword is held ready to strike. The globe in his hand symbolizes, of course, Rome's immense power over the world at the time, and again, Akihiko's newfound strength. Interestingly, there's a little guy sitting inside of Caesar's chest. This could represent the idea that Caesar is meant to be a depiction of Rome itself, with the man in the center being the ruler that guides it. Or, it could also be that Shinjiro is a guiding force in Akihiko's decision to move forward, kept ever present in his heart. Fuka Yamagishi, the Technophile Navigator. Her persona is Lucia of the Priestess Arcana. Lucia of Syracuse, also known as Saint Lucia, was a Christian martyr who died during the Diocletianatic persecution, which was the last and most severe persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire starting in the year 303. Lucia was a devout young woman who lived her life in alms and consecrated her virginity for God, much to the dismay of her betrothed. Lucia's mother, Eutychia, arranged for her to marry a wealthy pagan, but she refused. Eventually, Eutychia respected Lucia's decision to abstain from the wedding, yet her betrothed was so enraged that he reported her to the Christian magistrates, threatening to have her defiled in a brothel. She was asked to burn a sacrifice to the emperor's image, which she refused, and was faced with execution. As the guards were approaching, Lucia knelt down and prayed for salvation. That salvation came in a strange way, as when they tried to move her, she was completely fixed to the ground where she knelt. The guards became so frustrated they tried to violently uproot her, and even went so far as to stab her and light her on fire. Yet even through all this, she remained fixed to her position, venerating God. Christians believe her body to have been filled with the Holy Spirit, performing this miracle. Lucia's betrothed, seeing this, said that if he could not have her beautiful eyes, no one could, and proceeded to gouge out her eyes and slash her throat. Even through so much suffering, she could still see and prophesied an end to the Christian persecution. With one final stab from a guard, Lucia's life came to an end. As she was being prepped for burial, it was discovered that Lucia's eyes had been miraculously restored, more beautiful than they were even in life. Oh my god, now I know why this game has a mature rating. Now, what does this have to do with Fuku Yamagishi? Not much really. I think they just chose her because she was attributed to heavenly sight and is a good fit for the navigator position. Fuka is an incredibly shy and kind girl, holding no grudges even to her previous bully and always being polite. She shows great zeal in helping seas with their missions. Her actions do convey a certain degree of saintliness, but let's hope she lives a long and happy life. None of that eye gouging and burning. Lucia's design is that of a woman with long flowing hair draped over a pink dress. Lucia's face is blood red with bandages covering her eyes, symbolizing the circumstances of the saint's death, and her lower half is what looks like a glass eye. Fuka awakening to her persona shows her knelt down within the eye, protected from all harm. An elegant and venerable design.
Igis, the manufactured anti-shadow waifu. Her persona is Palladion of the Chariot Arcana, but Igis herself is Aeon. In Greek and Roman mythology, the Palladion was a cult image of utmost importance which the safety of Troy and later Rome was said to depend. The image was a wooden statue of Pallas Athena that Odysseus and Diomedes stole from the citadel of Troy and was later taken to the future site of Rome. The Palladion was worshipped as the protectress of the city and called the carving that fell from heaven. Athena is the goddess of wisdom, courage, inspiration, justice, and many more, whose valor aided Heracles and Perseus to many victories. You should understand why the statue would mean so much to the Greeks. Igis first appears as a cold automaton just following orders, however after some maintenance, her artificial intelligence helps her develop almost human-like emotions. After this, Igis becomes the pillar of seas, aiding them with wisdom and firepower. What was once an artifact that merely showed the visage of a human like the original Igis in the Palladion, Igis awakens into that which she portrays. Igis becomes a superhuman aid to the journey of seas, as Athena once did to the great heroes of old. Palladion's design is a giant lance attached to what looks like a motor surrounded by armor that's fitted for a woman. A detached face rests underneath the lance that looks to be sleeping. When awakened to Athena, however, the design is completely human-like, depicting a woman in a flowing white robe, with the centurion's helmet on, wielding a large spear and ornate shield surrounding her body. The design is stylized, but generally identical to the artistic depictions of Athena. A perfect fit for Agus's character arc. Koromaru, the... dog. His persona is Cerberus, of the Strength Arcana. Cerberus is a giant three-headed dog that guards the gates of Hades. Almost all depictions of Cerberus describe him as a horrific, flesh-eating beast loyally guarding his master Hades' domain. Accounts of Cerberus may also say that he has many more heads, up to 100 in fact, and snakes protruding through his body. Cerberus' main appearance in myth is within the Twelve Labors of Heracles, in which Heracles had to retrieve Cerberus from Hades and present him to Eurystheus. Heracles accomplished this with the help of Athena and Apollo by wrestling the dog into submission with a lion's pelt, upon which Hades agreed to part with Cerberus for a short time. This story though I find to be irrelevant to Koromaru, for obvious reasons. I think Cerberus was chosen as Koromaru's persona for the simple fact that he is a loyal companion to the lord of the underworld, Hades keeping in line with the Greek myth-inspired personas. Koromaru's personality, however, was based on a real-world dog named Hachiko. Hachiko was a farm dog adopted by Professor Ueno at Tokyo University, who brought him to live in Shibuya with him. Hachiko would meet Ueno at Shibuya Station every day after his commute home. After only a year of companionship, Ueno died of a cerebral hemorrhage while at work on May 21st, 1925. From then until the poor dog's death on March 8, 1935, Hachiko would return to Shibuya Station every day to wait for Ueno's return. Almost 10 full years of a loyal dog awaiting his master's love. Well after his death though, Hachiko is remembered in culture as a symbol of loyalty. Koromaru has a similar backstory, walking at his master's shrine long after his death, every day. He shows similar loyalty to the members of Seas, as even he fiercely battles the shadows with the strength of character that allows him to wield a persona. Cerberus' design is that of a three-headed black dog with blue underbelly, collared by chains to wings attached to their front legs. Instead of paws, Cerberus has tridents for feet, and a long pointed tail possibly symbolizing the snake protrusions on historical accounts. Who knew there would be so much to talk about with a literal dog? Ken Amada, the boy genius. His persona is Nemesis of the Justice Arcana. In Greek mythology, Nemesis was the goddess of vengeance and divine retribution, the daughter of Nyx, goddess of night and shadow. Nemesis is the distributor of fortune, neither good nor bad, simply in due proportion to each according to what they deserve. The act she's most well known for is the punishment of Narcissus. Due to Narcissus's immense hubris, he scorned all of his suitors, believing himself to be above them. As punishment, Nemesis lured him to a pool where he gazed upon his own reflection and fell so deeply in love with it that he refused to move and died staring at himself. Her way of doling out justice is more poetic than violent, and is most likely the Greek's version of the belief in karma. Ken Amada, after the death of his mother, was distraught, and with the dismissal of the police, he became consumed with the idea of revenge at a young age. He gave up his childhood in pursuit of the truth behind the incident, so much so that he implies he intended to end his life once he found vengeance. His investigation led him to the truth of Shinjiro Aragaki being the perpetrator. After Ken confronts Shinjiro, he comes to understand the mental turmoil that he was in as well, for a different reason. 
Once you take a life, there's no going back, and after all your hatred is gone, you only have regret. After their conversation, they're attacked by Strega, and Shinjiro sacrifices himself to protect the innocent Ken's life. With Shinjiro's death, justice is served to both Shinjiro and Ken. Ken grows to be one that appreciates life and lives on with the memory of his mother and Shinjiro in his heart. Poetic justice, for sure. Nemesis' design is a sleek, black, metallic body with a saw blade passing through the top and bottom of the persona. There's a face in the chest of the persona with large red gemstone eyes and a sharp, fanged smile. I don't get the design much, but it looks cool. Also, I couldn't relate it to Ken, but Nemesis is possibly the true mother of Polydeuces and Castor. Pretty cool, huh? Shinjiro Aragaki, the brooding delinquent. His persona is Castor of the Hierophant Arcana. Castor was talked about in the Akihiko section thanks to my buddy Marsh, but I'll talk about him again if you're watching different segments. Castor and Polydeuces were the twin sons of Lida, but had different fathers. Castor was the mortal son of Tyndarius, king of Sparta, while Polydeuces was son of Zeus, king of the gods. Even though Polydeuces was a demigod and Castor was immortal, they were inseparable. Fighting alongside the Argonauts, destroying the city of Lolcus as revenge for their treachery, and rescuing the pair's sister Helen from the city of Attica. They were called the Dioscuri, translating to Sons of Zeus, even though only one of the brothers were. Castor was fatally wounded by one of his two brothers' spears after a, what we'll call a marital dispute. With the last of his strength, he called out to warn his brother. Polydeuces slayed one of the cousins, and Zeus called a thunderbolt to finish off the other, saving his son. After the battle, Polydeuces returned to Castor and begged Zeus to allow him to share his immortality with his brother. His wish was granted, and the pair were carried up to the heavens to become the Gemini constellation. Shinjiro Aragaki was one of the original members of Seas, along with Akihiko and Mitsuru. Though Shinji and Akihiko were not together for a large portion of the game, their bond is stated very clearly. The only reason why Shinji left Akihiko was because his persona went out of control and killed a bystander. That bystander being Kanamata's mother. Shinjiro could never attain full control over his persona like Akihiko did and receded into the shadows after the accident. The only reason he joins back is he's convinced by an injured Akihiko to lend his power to fight the ever-growing threat of shadows. Shinji ultimately meets his end, protecting Ken. Castor was chosen for Shinji's persona as he was the weaker persona user between him and Akihiko. His death even somewhat mirrors Castor's in his final act being the protection of another. Only difference is that he was killed by a bullet, not a spear. Though Ken did try. Castor's design is almost the same as Polydeuces' design, with a black motif rather than white. He's riding a stylized armored horse with a spear tip embedded in his chest, the same manner in Castor's death. When seen together, it really does represent the legendary Dioscuri. That wraps up the Specialized Extracurricular Execution Squad. Leave a comment letting me know your favorite member's persona down below, and while you're there, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Fuka was my favorite persona source material, but learning more about Koromaru really broke my heart. I think this one might be the hardest to decide a favorite. Big shout out to Marsh for doing Akihiko's segment. His channel will be in the pinned comment below. Every episode will have a guest on it, so stay tuned to find out who's next. I thought I knew a fair amount of Greek mythology, but researching this video really put into perspective the sheer magnitude of this culture's history. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next Tony for You. Have a good one.